tour. We're so grateful to have him here in Philadelphia at the Unitarian Society of Germantown. I was reflecting, uh, introducing John is in a concise manner is not an easy task. <laughs> he is a man of uh, great scope and gravitas in his career and his ministry. I am a about to be 52 year old lifetime Unitarian Universalist who entered seminary in 94. And uh, in my life, um, I don't remember John not being an influence as a leader in uh, the faith movement and ministry. I was fortunate um, that my first job as campus minister for the Mid-Atlantic States was housed at Universalist National Memorial Church in D.C. And uh, John had a strong relationship of mentorship and coming out of a similar church with Vanessa Southern who was uh, the minister of that church. So I got to know him a little bit more. His daughter was living in the same apartment as Vanessa at the same time. And um, John, I got to be around him a bit uh, to pick his brain. And um, <coughs> so it's a special to have you here tonight, John. John served for eight years as president of the Unitarian Universalist Association. He gave the faith movement, um, a high profile of positivity and high impact, both in the, um, the prophetic, but also in the compassionate uh, way we present ourselves in the world. John is one of the more traveled Unitarian Universalist leaders living today. I was um, grilling him, I think he may be the most traveled you leader living today. He's been to 22 countries, 650 congregations. And That's 22 countries with Unitarian University. Right, 22 <laughs> countries representing, uh, I'm sorry, that, right, that he's, he's been to more countries than that is, I've visited. Thank you, I'm saying in leadership role. Um, in his ministry and visiting our sister organizations and Unitarian Universalists around the globe. He's been to 22 countries. As a minister doing ministry, he's been to 650 congregations. He's trying to figure out when the last time he was here was. <laughs> We're not clear. Bill Gardner's time. Bill Gardner's time. Um, John's written seven books. It's a co-author. He, in my opinion, is absolutely one of the top scholars and intellects in our movement living today. We give out one of his books to our new members, Chosen Faith. John has a baritone voice and a big chest filled with a big heart. And many of us who've been to GA have experienced him talk, pray, speak in ways that can move thousands of people uh, with stories of the heart. He he's one of the leaders who taught us that real men do cry. Yep. We've seen John many times crying in public, which I think is excellent. And this book, as we've uh, been saying throughout the course of this day since uh, I saw him late morning, is a tremendous exploration of <coughs> important transcendentalist and Unitarian history, helping us see the trends of how imperfect people uh, who at times are stumbling and falling backwards and making mistakes, also are helping to check the trajectory of faith and goodness on the planet move forward. The one where he and I have been talking a lot about today, one step back, two forward. So I think tonight we know it's so pertinent of how we're reflecting not only on this rich history, but how it might pertain to us discerning how to live out our faith most effectively with compassion and justice for all. Uh, welcome to Reverend John Burns. I don't like to hide behind lecterns. Um, thank you for that, Ken. Uh, you can hold a little you remind low. me of the old saw that the, uh, the uh, introduction should be to the uh, speaker, the way the fan is to the fan dancer. It should be there, but not try to cover everything. 
to reflect upon. <laughs> In the course of speaking about this book, I've often begun with stories that are local and relevant. Um, so much of the transcendentalist movement is centered in the Northeast that, uh, frankly, here in the Philadelphia area, it's a little bit more of a challenge. But the <laughs> minister of the first church here in Philadelphia, uh, Furness, and was clearly a transcendentalist, a friend of Emerson and Channing, and in fact, one of the most important addresses that William Ellery Channing ever gave as the spiritual leader of our faith was given in Philadelphia at First Church in 1841, or maybe it was early 1842, certainly in the winter. It's called The Church. And in it, Channing was really asserting a couple of very important principles. One was how important it is in an authentic church to allow spiritual leaders to exercise prophetic leadership, to have complete freedom of the pulpit. The other theme <coughs> that Channing devoted the last two years of his life to was emancipation, that is, anti-slavery. Uh, he chose the particular term emancipation because that was the one that was used by the British in abolishing slavery in the Caribbean in the 1830s. And Channing was actually um, trying to get American anti-slavery activists to pay attention to how they went about it. They didn't do it instantaneously. I, I think he perceived that um, to simply end slavery, and we saw this at the end of the Civil War, without providing a transition for people who had been enslaved into the competitive free labor market was to invite human disaster. Um, there's a book that records some things that wasn't, weren't spoken about in the Boston area, but were very real. It's a book called Black Walden. And it's about what happened to the enslaved people of the wealthiest family near Concord, Massachusetts, when slavery in, was ended in Massachusetts, basically by judicial decision at the time of the American Revolution and the adoption of John Adams' Constitution for the Commonwealth. The Cotman family had about a dozen house servants, and when their enslavement became illegal, they bade them farewell put them out with no transitional support whatsoever. All 12 of them tried to find ways to sustain themselves. A few built cabins around Walden Pond. Thoreau knew, knew about it. His cabin was based on one of these freedmen cabins. Not a single one of the 12, according to the study that was done in this book, Black Walden survived to the old age, escaped disease or malnutrition, or ever had a child. Freedom could have been just freedom to die. Mm. That's not freedom. Mm. At early in his ministry, Channing actually wrote a letter to Daniel Webster, who later proved to be more of a hindrance than a help in the anti-slavery cause. He's one of the authors of the Compromise of 1850 that included the despicable fugitive slave law. But earlier in his political career, he'd been a sometime attendant on Channing's preaching at the Federal Street Church in Boston. And Channing had dared to write him a letter suggesting that one of the things he should be advocating for in Washington was the allocation of some of the public lands in the West to help fund the transition that would be necessary to end the South's peculiar institution and enable formerly enslaved people to have lives of opportunity, promise, and dignity. History is full of what ifs. You know, you wonder what what if they had actually done that? There were movements, you know, in the 18th 
teen, teens and 20s particularly, in the border states to end slavery uh, voluntarily. It was not economically viable in the Chesapeake area anymore. Uh, by um, the era of the transcendentalists of Maryland had almost equal populations of freed African Americans and still enslaved African Americans. Philadelphia, of course, was very much tied up with uh, the work of Moses, that Did you put that was called. Here, yeah, I, can, I certainly could do that, thank you. But uh, the, the traffic that went before, between the Delmarva Peninsula and Philadelphia in <coughs> helping people escape from slavery was really quite dramatic. One of the most important people, of course, to escape from Maryland slavery, first through Philadelphia and then on up to Massachusetts, was the man who became the most eloquent and best known uh, fugitive slave in American history, namely Frederick Douglass. And this weekend I'm going to be going up to Rochester, New York, where he established first the North Star, then called Frederick Douglass's paper. And uh, I'm going to be speaking both to the people of First Unitarian Society or church up there, where Susan Anthony was a member, and then to the Frederick Douglass a Family Institute in the afternoon. The people in my book are notable, as I was saying to some people uh, over dinner and before this gathering, uh, for the way in which they went about forming deep spiritual friendships, almost as a spiritual practice, and friendships that often crossed lines of difference, difference in age, uh, gender, social location, theology, and the most difficult in their era, race, perhaps still the most difficult. There's a great book out from Beacon, by the way, about, um, well, I'm going to block on her name, Deborah. Uh, um, it's about cross-racial relationships, friendships, and both the promise and the challenges of gaining and maintaining those. Well, one of my discoveries in doing this book actually involves Frederick Douglass. <coughs> I didn't know it until I read Douglas Blight's big biography, which uh, is, I think just won the Pulitzer Prize in biography, um, that the very first dollar that Frederick Douglass earned as a free man came from a Unitarian minister <laughs> in New Bedford, Massachusetts, Ephraim Peabody, uh, who gave him the opportunity to sort of do some chores, uh, you know, shovel the coal into the coal bin and things like that. But interestingly enough, Douglas never forgot that. He had been trained to, uh, to preach, basically in a black Methodist manner, even before he came north. But the longer he was in the north, the more he interacted with Unitarians. Especially in Boston during the 1850s, in the so-called vigilance committees that had arisen to um, rescue people from being returned to enslavement. Probably the most radical and effective leader on the white Unitarian side of that struggle was the Unitarian minister and transcendentalist Theodore Parker. And last January, I was in Florence, Italy, where Parker died. He died there because, like many people in this era, he suffered from tuberculosis. And the only prescription that was available was get thee to a climate where it's um, more humid and warm. And he went to the Caribbean and didn't get cured there. And I think he concluded that he might as well go see Greece and Rome if he was going to die. And he made it as far as Rome and went to Florence where the disease overcame him in 1860. He was probably lucky to be out of the country because he had been among the secret six that raised the funds to back John Brown in his attempt to raise a slave insurrection um, in, in and around Harper's Ferry. And then the goal was to 
create a sort of a underground mountain way, not railway, uh, people going to the hills of Appalachia and then moving north through Pennsylvania on up to um, northern New York, where one of the Secret Six, Garrett Smith, had established a sort of colony of free African Americans around New Elba, and where John Brown also had his family. Well, Frederick Douglass declined to participate in Brown's plan, I think quite um, prudently. I think he also had grave doubts that uh, people on plantations in Virginia were going to rise up and follow a white guy. So, when I was in Florence, I wanted to go and put some flowers on the grave of Theodore Parker. Why? Well, Parker was just an incredibly eloquent spokesperson for justice in our faith. In fact, in this week that has been dedicated to celebrating the birth of Dr. Martin Luther King, it's worth remembering that he is the original, he's the origin of that phrase so often associated and used by King, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Tracing how the quotations get picked up is an interesting historical uh, thing, by the way. And I have now, I think, proven that where uh, King got it was from a, the publication of the NAACP. The Crisis, in an article written by one of its white co-founders, the Unitarian minister John Haynes Holmes, who was one of the five incorporators of the NAACP, along with W.E.B. Du Bois and Mary Overton. Uh, Holmes was devoted to Parker in those men who he also often said was the inspiration for his own ministry at what became the Community Church of New York, where he also co-founded the ACLU, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, and many other uh, noble causes. He was one of the first defenders of Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood. Holmes was named for John Haynes, his grandfather, who was the treasurer of Parker's congregation in Boston. I once saw in the office of the Community Church of New York the desk on which Theodore Parker had written his sermons and where he often had a loaded pistol on the, de on the top because he had a fugitive slave in the house that he was determined to protect no matter what law enforcer came to enforce a despicable and immoral law. He is also the source, you know, of the phrase government of the people, by the people, for the people. That came down to Abraham Lincoln for use in the Gettysburg Address because Lincoln's law partner in Springfield, Illinois, William Herndon, was a friend of Parker's, a devotee, somebody who got his printed sermons through the mail and who came multiple times to Boston, all the way from Springfield, just to hear Parker. Where Parker would preach at the music hall to crowds that often overflowed a theater that seated 2,400 people. Well, in Florence, last January, by happenstance, I was introduced to the woman who is uh, both a nun and the keeper of the Protestant cemetery where Parker is buried. <laughs> and she turned out to be somebody who has a PhD in American history from Cal Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> and Sister Julia, in meeting me and hearing that I was going to put flowers on Parker's grave, said, you know it's not the original marker, don't you? Oh, no, the widow couldn't afford much. It was flat against the earth, kind of plain. The monument that's there now was paid for by Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. <coughs> In 1887, when Douglass was the best known African American on the planet, he was touring Europe and he did the remarkable thing of arranging 
to take the overnight train from Rome to Florence, arriving on the exact anniversary of the day that Theodore Parker had died there. And that evening he wrote to a friend, you were right about the marker, it's not worthy of the man. A man like that should have a monument that is a sermon in itself. When passing through Rome himself, Parker had um, allowed himself to be sculpted in clay by a man named William Wetmore Story, one of the better sculptors of his time. Was a, one of his sculptures in um, your Museum of Modern Art, our Museum of Art here in Philadelphia, another in San Francisco. Um, Douglas went back to William Wetmore Story, whose father was Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court Joseph Story, co-founder of uh, Harvard Law School, and the judge who had ruled in favor of the Africans aboard the ship Amistad. And he commissioned Story to do the monument that stands nobly, I would say, over Theodore Parker's grave to this day. It has a bas-relief bust of Parker in profile and treats him as the great American preacher, an advocate of ending slavery, and then below his dates and inscribed name are the words. His name is here inscribed in marble. His virtues on the hearts of those whom he saved from slavery and superstition. By the way, not only that inscription, but a number of other things which Blight does deal with in his biography, I think make a case that by the end of his life, Frederick Douglass himself was more of a transcendentalist than he was a preacher of the kind of black Methodism he had been raised in. <clears throat> his close companion in his later years was a woman from Germany who was a free thinker and a skeptic and influenced by the same German idealism that lay behind the transcendentalist movement in the first place. People often ask me to define transcendentalism and um, all I can tell you is that they themselves resisted <laughs> defining it. When Emerson himself gave a lecture in 1841 on, called The Transcendentalist, he offered the extremely inadequate and somewhat frustrating definition that transcendentalism is idealism as it appears in 1841. <laughs> he traced the idea all the way back to Plato. But the real source, <coughs> philosophically, I think, is in the German, the, or the uh, most important influence on the German <coughs> family, namely Immanuel Kant. And if you know any <coughs> philosophical history at all, you probably know that Kant is best known for what he called the categorical imperative in ethics. That is, you have no right to formulate a moral norm for others that you would not be, wish to have imposed on yourself, which, by the way, makes it a little hard to keep women in their place <laughs> or enslave folks, right? Or to ignore the educational needs of the poor. All of these things soaked into these Unitarian ministers and friends who were transcendentalists and then manifested themselves <coughs> in real social action and forged them into friendships. The people who didn't entirely agree with details of theology or tactics, but who were committed to that kind of pushing that moral art. Um, Kant had argued also that, you see, before we start to take in knowledge of the world through the senses, there are certain transcendent categories that are wired into our consciousness that sort out good and evil, and the temporary and the eternal. And that these are what really shape our moral and spiritual orientation as we try to interact with one another. To the extent that we just 
pay attention to uh, calculating advantage uh, in the marketplace and using sense data to figure out what we're going to do next and what serves our own needs. That's understanding. That's Coleridge interpreted Kant. But to use reason is to understand that my full flourishing as a human being in my moral and spiritual life depends on my being involved in caring about yours. I can't, I, I will stay small. I will fail to fill, fulfill my potential as a human being unless I care about you and you and you. Uh, unless I get out of my, I transcend my ego needs in order to make this the kind of world in which more and more people are treated not as objects of convenience, but as moral agents, as spiritual beings who need our friendship, who need to be respected for their moral choices, who need to be given opportunities to use their moral agency. <clears throat> We forget this stuff at our peril. And that I don't have to persuade you, I don't think, very much, that we are now in a perilous time when, in fact, um, self-centeredness is in the set. And the idea of caring about the other is regarded as foolish and sentimental. You see it in, um, in too much of our commerce, and you certainly see it now even in our politics. I was reading a almost transcript of a conversation between the current incumbent of the Oval Office and the senior generals of the Pentagon who were trying to explain to him why we have treaties why we have an international order that cares about people in developing countries. <clears throat> and the response was, but what are we going to get out of it in the way of money? God help us. Almost to a person, the transcendentalists were grandchildren of people who'd been active in the American Revolution. Emerson's grandfather as the minister in Concord, Parker's grandfather as the leader of the Minutemen in Lexington, Margaret Fuller's grandfather as a minister who left the pulpit to enter politics, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, another radical transcendentalist minister, had a grandfather who threw the tea in the harbor in Boston. But their intervening generation was a disappointment. After the American Revolution and after the second uh, attempt to break away from Britain in the War of 1812, they wanted normalcy. They wanted commerce. They wanted um, just to settle down and make money. And by 1836, when the first transcendentalists get together <laughs> to protest the education they had received at Harvard, <laughs> That's the first meeting. It's on the bicentennial of Harvard College. The president of the college had just gone on for two and a half hours about what an illustrious history the college had achieved in bringing Latin and Greek to the Native Americans. And an educated clergy to the pulpit, etc. And four young Unitarian ministers, the oldest of them 35, repair to a tavern in Cambridge, basically to call bullshit. <laughs> and to say, what we need to do for one another is have a study group that brings us in touch with the kind of thinking that is going to be necessary for a moral and spiritual renewal in our churches, in our schools, and in our culture. George Ripley, 
minister of a church in the Boston slums, was tremendously troubled by the fact that all around his church people were homeless, often drunk, women prostituting themselves, <coughs> hungry. The inequality in society was growing by the day. <coughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson had come back from a trip he took to Europe after the death of his young wife spent the summer writing a book called Nature, in which he began by saying, our age is retrospective, it writes histories and biographies, it, why should we not have a direct experience of the divine ourselves and not just the history of theirs? George Putnam was the minister in Roxbury, now largely forgotten, and most importantly in this little quartet, was a guy named Frederick Henry Hedge. Smart little water snapper. At the age of 12, he qualified for admission to Harvard. His father was the professor of philosophy, Levi Hedge. Father had the good sense to know that Frederick was not quite ready for college at 12. Although, by the way, this, in that era, it was not unusual for a boy to enter the college at 50 or 60 and to graduate by 20. Since the curriculum was almost all around Latin and Greek classics and basic natural science and a little math. Well, Hedge had gone to Germany to get ready to go to college. And he studied in three different gymnasia in Germany and became fluent in German and soaked up the influence of Kant and the early German idealists. He is one of the conduits that brought to these ministers the importance of getting a sort of non-materialistic philosophy behind spiritual and moral thinking. Another person who did it is the person whose death is depicted, uh, I'm sorry to say, on the cover of my book. Um, the book gets its title Conflagration from a couple of different sources. One is from a poem by Frederick Douglass written in uh, the period right before the outbreak of the Civil War, when he says that the spirit of the American Revolution has kind of gone to sleep, but it's going to be rekindled, it needs to be rekindled, and what it is, it's going to be with kind of with a bang that will bring about a second American Revolution that will wrap the South in wild conflagration. Prophetic about the Civil War and Fort Sumter. The other source is the sinking, the burning of the steamer Lexington on Long Island Sound 180 years ago this week. On the night of January the 13th, 1840, the Lexington left a pier on Lower Manhattan with about 100 passengers, headed for New England, and loaded with 150 bales of slave pig cotton on the deck, some of them placed rather too close to the smokestack. <coughs> it was a very cold night. Ice crystals were being formed by the waves. Everybody gathered inside where there was a supper for the passengers and crew. Nobody was watching when the bales of cotton burst into flame. They quickly burned through any possible access to the engine room so that the captain couldn't even tell the engineer to stop the ship. The paddle wheels kept going. And then burned through the steering cable that were ropes. I can't imagine what it was like on that ship, but in the first prologue, in the prologue of my book, it's really a symbol of what was going on in America in 1840. The ship of state 
going full steam, nobody in the steering, on fire, due to slave pig cotton. The person who died aboard that ship who was best known was the Unitarian minister, Charles Fallon. Born Karl Christian Theodor Friedrich Fallon in Germany, he had actually come to the United States as a political refugee. Because in the reactionary period in Europe that followed the defeat of Napoleon, he had dared as a young law professor to rise up and suggest that under conditions of sufficient oppression, it was permissible for the people to rise up against tyrants. One of his friends committed an actual act of political terrorism. He fled to, to Switzerland, then to France. He came to America in 1825 with Lafayette, who was returning to the United States for the 50th anniversary of the American Revolution, and who had embraced the ideals of the French Revolution, as did follow. Well, with Lafayette's help, Charles Fallon had found a job at Harvard <coughs> teaching German, and by the way, introducing gymnastics in America. <laughs> this is not a guy who lived just from the neck up. He, he charmed the students because he actually cared about physical culture and set up a classroom with exercise apparatus and outside equipment to use in good weather. One of his favorite students was a young Unitarian minister named James Freeman Clark, who is the thread figure through my whole book, because he was really the best person in that era, I think, at forming friendships that really mattered all across the lines. But Fallon's death is a good place to start the story of the Transcendentalist, because he's a forgotten figure in how this German <coughs> idealism got to America. <coughs> and because he precipitated a real crisis in the life of the leading figure in American Unitarianism at the time, William Ellery Channing, with whom I began, who came down here to Philadelphia to preach about the church and the importance of emancipation and freedom of the pulpit. Fallon had been Channing's personal representative in the <coughs> slavery circles. Because like Parker, William Ellery Channing had tuberculosis his entire adult life. The previous year, he had only been able to summon enough strength to get to the pulpit six times in the whole year. He had a young associate who filled in. Normally, he was pretty restrained almost stoic. But when he heard about Charles Fallon's death, he just dissolved. The next day he was waited upon by another Unitarian minister who was very active with the Anti-Slavery Society, indeed uh, employed by the society as an agent. Um, Samuel Joseph May, Main Memorial Church in Syracuse, New York, is named for him because he was one of the most courageous Unitarian abolitionists of the period. Brother May said that he knew how close Channing had felt to Charles Fallon and how difficult it might be for him to actually provide a memorial service for his friend and protege. So he had taken the liberty of asking the Anti-Slavery Society to sponsor the memorial service and he had begun to draft a eulogy himself. But the proper place for the memorial service was certainly going to be in Channing's Federal Street Church, where Fallon had been ordained to the Unitarian ministry. He'd lost his job at Harvard for being an abolitionist. And when he entered the Unitarian ministry, he went to New York to try out to be the Unitarian minister there. And although the congregation loved him, three wealthy people in the congregation who had a lot of influence and were trustees, essentially blocked Fallon's being called as the minister there. So he lost his job as a Unitarian minister. He was lecturing and going back up to Boston to become the pastor of a smaller Unitarian church 
in East Lexington, aboard the steamer Lexington, when he died. He had a wife, a child. Channing asked the trustees of his church for permission to have the Anti-Slavery Society sponsor this memorial service in the building. Although they initially said yes, under pressure from conservative people who had interests in the cotton trade, they then denied the permission. <coughs> and Channing was just devastated. I think he felt that he had preached for over 30 years without being able to penetrate the conscience of his people who were still in thrall to filthy lucre. Mm. And his response was both temperate and pointed. Mm. He exercised his pastoral prerogative to preach a sermon about folly. It's a better sermon than the one we, the ones we get to read when we're in seminary again. <laughs> because the discourse occasioned by the death of the Reverend Dr. Charles Fallon is a meditation on how you can reconcile the assumption that we have to make in faith that ultimately life is good, the universe is good, that it's capable of justice, that all of these qualities that we know in ourselves as possibilities have to be lifted up and attributed to the whole context in which we live if we are going to live faithfully. But that benevolence that we try to realize and hope for in the world as a, as a whole, how do you square that with suffering? The suffering that was, must have been experienced on that day, or, or by the widow and the orphan, or by chanting himself and losing this friend. It's a poignant sermon, I quote part of it. But the more important part of it is that a little later, closer to the annual meeting of the congregation, Channing wrote to the, his trustees who had let him down so dreadfully and basically said, um, I've decided to resign my role as your public minister, not your pastor. And you can keep all of my remaining salary or give it to my associate. In other words, keep your filthy money. And I will not be beholden to you for what I say on public matters. As I say, he then came down here to Philadelphia to talk about freedom of the pulpit. And his last major address was on August 1st, Emancipation Day, the anniversary of the British ending slavery in the Caribbean, a holiday then observed by African Americans up and down the <coughs> Northeast. With the, his most pointed statement on what the North had to do in order to end slavery in the country. He knew it wouldn't be easy. After delivering that address, he himself succumbed to infectious disease and his tuberculosis and died. These are the opening chapters of the book. They lead up to the founding of the first Transcendentalist congregation in Boston which was largely made up of people who came out of Channing's congregation just dreadfully upset about how he had been treated. Elizabeth Palmer Peabody was virtually Channing's volunteer secretary and <coughs> in addition to following his closest spiritual friend, the woman who probably gave him the push to actually start using the term Unitarian about himself. By the way, Channing hated labels. He felt that it was a spiritual temptation for us to label ourselves abolitionist or transcendentalist or unitarian or progressive or liberal because there's a tendency when you adopt a label like that to say, oh, well, no, I'm one of the good people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and he felt very strongly that what matters is our character, not our abstract beliefs, and how our character applies itself in our deeds and our work. It was he who had encouraged a man named, a politician named Horace Mann to give up political ambition and devote his life to a crusade for quality, free public education for the children of the poor. It was Channing who persuaded a woman named Dorothea Dix first to go into the jails as a minister where the men had failed. and recognize that many of the people who were jailed were there simply because of their disability or mental illness. And to start a national crusade for decent treatment of people with such infirmities. If you see a, a, a statue of Channing in the, uh, the corner of the public garden in Boston, it makes him look like he was eight feet tall because he was a spiritual giant. But the fact of the matter is that times he weighed somewhere between 90 and 100 pounds because he was so ill. <clears throat> Sunken eyes. Um, his power as a preacher came out of his vulnerability. That's why I cry sometimes, Ken. I, you know, it's, it's one part empathy with these intractable aspects of human suffering that we ought to all too often ignore. And it's one part, frankly, gratitude to be in a tradition right. where I am continually inspired by the people who went before me and challenged to live up to what they did knowing how much is left undone. Well, I could talk about a lot of other aspects of the work of the Transcendentalists. George Ripley, who was one of the original four, finally quit that church that wouldn't do enough about the poor all around it to start a little experiment in more egalitarian living called Brook Farm. It, by the way, shouldn't be treated as some kind of foolish exercise. It actually accomplished more than you can imagine, especially for the women who lived there. Because they actually found some egalitarian distribution of domestic duties and there was real creativity uh, an agency finally possible. Margaret Fuller visited often, had her, her uh, brother uh, at school there, produced uh, in John White Sullivan um, probably America's first great music critic. But the place burned, another conflagration. They were expanding and building a great new uh, building that would house a couple of hundred people. And it was heavily mortgaged, and then there were no fire departments. This was another great danger in cities. Fires burned a lot of stuff. One of the reasons you can't find a lot of the sites in downtown Boston that were associated with the Transcendentalists is that, like Chicago, Boston went through a great fire and those sites were swept away. So people think that it's all out in Concord, which was a more affluent community and it's been able to preserve Emerson's house and the Ellicott house and the graves on Author's Ridge and it's a Walden Pond. It's lovely. It makes a good literary pilgrimage. It's not the center of Transcendentalism. And the Transcendentalists were anything but sort of Thoreauvian individualists who were tucked away in the woods. No, they were, for the most part, church people who wanted the church to be more, better and more than it was. They wanted a moral and spiritual revival in the community and saw the church as critical to showing the way build community within in order to transform the community around. This was an old New England sense of mission of the parish church, where no pound could exist without a 
parish church that was called to be concerned not just about the well-being or pastoral care of its members, but about the quality of community and justice <coughs> in the town as a whole. Mm -hmm. That's our mission, right from our roots, which we forget at our peril, especially in times like these. Mm -hmm. So I could talk about you know, this in relation to economic inequality. I could talk about it in relation to women's rights. You know, earlier I was talking about how the women's movement in America split over race after the Civil War, and how the Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan Anthony Wing wrote the Boston women out of the story. It's one of the people who wrote an early review of my book on Amazon said, I've been studying the suffrage movement. The transcendentalists didn't have anything to do with it. Yeah, that's because Stanton and Anthony wrote them out. Stanton went to Margaret Fuller's Conversations for Women that really launched the raising of consciousness of women in America to claim more opportunities for education, the professions. You know, Margaret wrote Woman in the 19th Century in which she answered the question, you know, if you ask what professions do I think women should enter, I say, let them be sea captains. Maybe if she had a woman sea captain on the boat she took home from Italy, <laughs> uh, it wouldn't have foundered off Fire Island in the tragedy that drowned her and her baby and the baby's father. But her first boyfriend, she never married, James Freeman Carr, <laughs> Unitarian minister, guy who published her first essays, fellow that she encouraged to become a real leader. He gathered Emerson and Channing's nephew and they salvaged her reputation in the memoir of Margaret Fuller, Ossily. Women wouldn't have respected Margaret if they thought she was an unmarried mother. Uh, Victorian norms. These people stuck with one another to death Nothing moves me more than the friendship that Frederick Douglass felt toward Theodore Parker that he would put up that monument 27 years after Parker died. But there's another cross-racial friendship in the book that gets a whole chapter, and it has to do with a guy named Lewis Hayden, who escaped from slavery in Kentucky where he'd been owned by the family of Henry Clay the co-author of The Compromise of 1850 and the Fugitive Slave Law. Mm. He gets to Boston, and John Andrew, a lawyer who is a member of Clark's congregation, hears him tell his story of escape and how his wife and son were sent south into the cotton fields, sold away from him. Well, he found another life companion who came with him into freedom. But he was no Frederick Douglass as an orator. He tried out as a speaker for the Anti-Slavery Society in front of the Concord Ant Women's Female Anti-Slavery <coughs> Society for an Emancipation Day picnic and rally on the slopes of Walden Pond where the speakers stood on the steps of Thoreau's cabin. And frankly, he failed as a speaker. His white allies didn't abandon him. They thought, there's probably another creative role that Lewis could play. So remembering that the first radical black abolitionist in town had run a used clothing store where people could come to get the warm clothing that they needed to get through a New England or Canadian winter, they set him up with such a store on the backside of Beacon Hill, where the African-American community of Boston had its center. And right behind it, he and his wife ran a boarding house, which when Harriet Beecher Stowe visited it, was housing 13 fugitives. It was the major station on the Underground Railroad in Boston. When Parker spoke in front of 4,000 people, about the capture of a slave from Virginia called Anthony Burns in 1854. 
by the way, he started by addressing the Bostonians as fellow citizens of Virginia, <laughs> pointing out to them that what the Fugitive Slave Law had done was make even liberty-seeking New Englanders subject to the laws of Virginia. When Parker did that, Lewis Hayden and Thomas Wentworth Higginson were at the courthouse preparing with a battering ram to knock in the door and try to rescue birds. The plan was to have somebody go to Faneuil Hall and shout, the African Americans are at the courthouse trying to free him now and have the 4,000 people pour out, led by Parker and others, and surround the courthouse and basically intimidate the relatively few officers there into freeing the captive. Unfortunately, it didn't work. The leaders ended up behind the crowd. They were up at the stage end of the hall. Everybody went up. So the crowd was leaderless. And the intimidation never pulled together the way that they had hoped. And even when Higginson and Hayden broke through the door of this, the um, courthouse, there was no way of getting the man free. But when Anthony Burns the next day was marched out to a Navy vessel to be sent back south, all of Boston poured out including the people with ties to the textile industry, like Abbott Amos Lawrence, who owned the mills of Lawrence, Massachusetts, who wrote in his journal, we went to bed old-fashioned Boston cotton wigs. We woke up stark raving abolitionists. <laughs> <laughs> this, my friends, is an example of the one step backward, two forward. I learned as a national leader of the Freedom to Marry movement that we actually had to lose some electoral battles in order to build sympathy for the cause. Losing forward is a strategy for building support for need of change. We are currently in a political moment in this country where God knows democratic values human rights, basic decency, has been seemingly defeated. I cannot believe that it's permanent. I believe that if, it, if we maintain the kind of solidarity across differences that our transcendentalist forebearers did, we have a chance to move two steps forward. They talked about a second American Revolution. It remained incomplete at the end of the Civil War because of Reconstruction and persistent racism. What we are involved in today, I believe, is a kind of third American revolution that includes concern for the conflagration of a planet, the denial of all of those difficulties. But I refuse, as a person of faith, to give up on the persistent example of these people who came before us and who are our forebears. So with that, I simply leave you with the suggestion that this period of history has never been more relevant, that we need the example of these remarkable forebears in our tradition, and that we need to emulate their practices of deep reflection, they kept journals, deep spiritual friendship, and transcending our comfort with people who are just like us by being in consistent solidarity with those who are most affected by the injustices that persist in our country. Thank you for your attention.